Lesson 2 is titled A Brief History of Mathematics and like Lesson 1 we're not doing any math problems here we're just learning some things about what math is and about its background which again I think those are important things in Lesson 1 we defined mathematics we came up with a definition there it's a language of science and a God-given tool for measuring and classifying pattern and shape so here we're gonna look at some of the background of mathematics and just what people were thinking about mathematics and I think this will help you just understand the why behind mathematics why are you doing mathematics why is it important which matters especially when you get frustrated and you're like why do I have to do this problem well because math matters so anyways look at this painting a famous painting the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci and that's from the early 1500s maybe you've heard of that painting before and da Vinci he was known for his use of mathematics and particular something called the divine proportion golden ratio it's also called it's a fraction equal to about 1.618 and here you can see I have this divine triangle superimposed over Mona Lisa's body there torso head and torso and it kind of reveals how da Vinci may have used this and other forms of the divine proportion in the painting there and so you can just kind of see how those sides of the triangle there just just touch her shoulders there and how the center of it goes right through her I mean for her that'd be her left eye and right through the center and so it just proportions her body just a little bit to the side and for whatever reason that tends to be a more aesthetically pleasing position in a in a painting or a drawing some of those divine proportions now da Vinci and other Christians they use things like that divine proportion in their work because they believed God used it in his work so what are some other mathematical patterns that remain to be discovered that might be like that proportion there and maybe you'll discover a new pattern or a new use of an old one like the divine proportion find a new use for that so think also about this if you want to paint like Leonardo da Vinci what would you do you'd study his works right things that he painted like the Mona Lisa so likewise if you want to paint like God then study his works including what he said in his word and what he made in creation so moving on no new rules and definitions in this lesson but we'll be just looking at a very brief history of mathematics here and uh, if you think about history the farther you go back in time and or the less evidence that you have for something the more controversy there is surrounding the truth of various historical claims and I don't expect you to believe everything that I believe about history but I think it's important for you to know that I believe the Bible's true and that includes the historical events that it describes so and that would include the flood described in Genesis I think that's one of the most important historical events the Bible describes I think it's interesting that evidence of the flood is everywhere in creation discussing all of that though, is not really the point of this course so I'm not going to dwell on that here however from a mathematical perspective I think it's interesting and a historical perspective no mathematical documents have been recovered from the pre-flood world described in the Bible none so most likely though the pre-flood humans included some very proficient mathematicians I mean if you take a look at a verse like Genesis 6:15, for example God gives Noah some exact dimensions for the ark 300 cubits long 50 wide 30 cubits tall a cubits about a foot and a half or so that's what that unit refers to so a 300 cubit long ship is 510 feet long or 155 meters that's really long and you know those aren't the kind of instructions we'd expect if so-called ancient people were these caveman style half monkey half human people that, that some believe they are well, I mean, think about it. Building a 510 foot long ship, that would require some really talented artisans capable of making all kinds of measurements, calculations. So, after the flood, though, the Bible describes that Babylon grew. Later to be dispersed by God, the Babylonians were dispersed. 
So if you trust the Bible's history, it's not surprising that the oldest recovered mathematical documents are from, guess who? The Babylonians. Everything before was destroyed. So let's continue on with our brief history here, beginning with the Egyptians and Babylonians, because that's where we have historical evidence from. That's where it starts. So that was from about 2,500 years before Christ, 2,500 years before Christ, to Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, 260. So it's difficult to say what knowledge was transferred to the Babylonians from the pre-flood world. We don't have historical documents of math computations before that. Some things we do know that the Egyptians and Babylonians had were a system of weights and measures, calendar, they could calculate perimeter area volume, they did financial and commercial calculations for raising taxes, for trade purposes, and math stagnated with them. They didn't just develop it past that. And one reason for that, I think, is because, and other scholars believe this too, that they worshipped the creation, the creature, not the creator, not God. Romans 125, if you look at that, that goes into a little more detail about that error. People still do this today, you know, making images of birds and cows, worshiping those. That's basically what we're talking about here. But those kinds of things, they can't make mountains and stars and oceans filled with life. So worshiping the creator of those things instead of the creation, that can lead to a better understanding of the purpose and the pattern. In other words, the math behind everything he makes. Up next, the Pythagoreans and you can make some very brief notes on these things like Pythagoreans and you can put the date down. You don't have to write everything that I'm writing right now. Just listen. This information is in your textbook pages and you know when you have problems from lesson two in your practice set, uh, uh, you'll have a, a lesson reference in your in your online course that you can click on and, and open up the textbook pages for lesson two and that's a good way to find the information that you need if you've forgotten it. But write some things down if you want to. That's totally fine. And like the subtitles, like Pythagoreans, but you don't have to write everything that you see here. So the Pythagoreans, 572 to 492 before Christ, they're credited with developing the Pythagorean theorem. It's a very useful mathematical tool. And the Babylonians they also knew about that, but Pythagoras was credited with creating that. Uh, you'll learn more about that in Lesson 54 as well. And Pythagoras, who the Pythagoreans were named after, he had a religious following of people, and they worshipped the reflection of God, mathematical order, rather than God himself. They worship numbers, is really what they did. And they believed the universe could be explained by the set of counting numbers. I don't quite get that at all, but that's what they did. Their cult disintegrated when they discovered that the square root of 2, you'll learn about square roots later, but the square root of 2, maybe you already know about them a little bit, in decimal form, that is like 1.4, and it just goes on and on. It's called an irrational number. They couldn't represent the square root of 2 by a simple fraction of integers. And that just totally, they, they lost it um, just over that. Now, we are going to cover those square roots in Lesson 30. We'll cover integers. If you're not sure what an integer is, it's just like a number that doesn't have a decimal on it, basically. Minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, things like that. Um, we'll cover those more in Lesson 5. But two conclusions we can draw from the Pythagoreans include, one, their cult was really weird. It's okay to call them weird. <laughs> they were. That was just really weird to worship numbers. And number two, everyone, though, including the Pythagoreans in that cult, they're created in God's image, right? And that's what Genesis 127 says. So God can use anyone he wishes to discover something great, like the Pythagorean theorem. That is a great discovery. And Pythagoras made some great application of that for us to use. Moving on to the Greeks, 600 BC to AD 450, they did a lot of great work on human reasoning. 
not just math, but just reasoning skills, developing reasoning skills. But they went a little too far in idolizing the human mind. So, for example, things that didn't make sense, like infinity, which we'll cover in Lesson 5, irrational numbers, kind of the same problem the Pythagoreans had, we'll cover those in Lesson 29, those kinds of things were basically ignored by them. So that's why they shied away from arithmetic and algebra. They focused more on geometry. And in fact, they just used two hand tools for geometry. They used a compass, not a magnetic compass, the kind you use to make circles. So maybe you've seen one of those, kind of looks like this, and it has a pencil attached on one side, and then this side is a sharp point. And so you can put that on your paper and put that sharp point and that's the center and then you just push that down and then you move the pencil around you rotate it around you can actually make a nearly perfect circle by just spinning that around relative to that circle center and then a straight edge of course that's just used for making straight lines so for example we use a ruler for a straight edge but theirs was even more crude than that it didn't have numbers on it it was just a straight edge so their pursuit of geometry, that helped to develop our understanding of mathematics abstract nature, where you have these ideas that can be applied in a bunch of different situations. One abstract idea applied in many concrete applications. Next, the Chinese, Inca, Mayan, American, Indian, talking about all these groups kind of together here, from 1030 BC to AD 1700. Now, supposedly, they were isolated from the mainstream of mathematical development. Supposedly, they were. But even so, they nevertheless had their own decimal numeral systems. And those display vestiges of their Babylonian ancestry, such as the widespread use of something called the sexagesimal or base 60 numeral system. We use a base 10 system, but the base 60 system, it's still in use today. Think about like 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, that sexagesimal numeral system. Now, the Mayans, for example, they had their own symbols for they're kind of similar to Roman numerals. They, they had one for zero, kind of look like this. And one was just a dot. Two was two dots. Three was three dots. Four was four dots. Five was just a bar. And then six was a bar and a dot and so on. So a similar idea to Roman numerals. Last up, Hindus and Arabians, 200 BC to AD 1200, and their numeral system, it's named after the Hindus, who probably invented it, and the Arabs, who passed the system on to Western Europe. So that's why we call it the Hindu-Arabic system, because to kind of give both groups some credit there on that numeral system. So they also invented negative numbers, the numeral zero, around the time of Christ's birth. Also about the same time the Mayans from all the way over in South America did. So perhaps these civilizations were less isolated than some think. And it's kind of interesting that numeral zero is like a, a starting over point. And that happened around the time of Christ's birth. So... Not that those are connected, I don't know. Maybe that's a question we can ask God when we get to heaven. I just think it's interesting that people were discovering those things. And, of course, the mystery of Jesus Christ and him being our Savior was revealed during that time as well. So, anyways, this isn't the end of our coverage of math history. In fact, with Shorman Math, we're always going to be thinking about history, trying to find connections to it not as much here in pre-algebra as we do in other courses but I think it's important to know some facts about the people behind the things you learn and that God created all of them and sometimes they are surrendered to Christ and following Christ and and our believers sometimes they're not but God's going to use them for his purposes regardless of their feelings about him so if you stick with Shorman Math for a while, you're going to learn names like Euclid, 
Da Vinci, who we already talked about, Euler, Newton, and others, they'll become quite familiar to you. Okay, well that's all for lesson two.